Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. We're just waiting for the last few people to um, come in and then we'll get started. We'll just give it another minute or two. see lots of people coming in still which is great right i think we'll get started then um Welcome to Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust's Wild Night in this evening. Um, it's really good to um, see so many people have joined us this evening. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm Alison Gardner and I'm Head of Fundraising and Communications at the Trust. Um, just a few little bits of housekeeping before we start. Um, we are going to be recording the session. And so if you don't want to appear on the recording, then please make sure that your camera is off. Um, and we'd also ask you if you keep your microphones for the evening as well, just so that everybody can hear the presentation in full. Um, Liz is going to give us a bit of an introduction and then at the end we're going to um, a bit of an overview and then at the end we'll have time for question and answer. So we'd, I'd encourage you to use the chat box on Zoom um, to put in any questions there. We'll collate them all and then we'll ask as many as we can at the end of the session. So yeah, please do use the chat box to ask questions. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Ugg Hill Farm's a really um, exciting project for the Trust and it's really great that we're able to share it with so many people um, tonight. So we'll get started now and I will hand you over to Liz Ballard, who is the Chief Executive of the Trust, to tell you a bit more. That's great, Alison. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, really warm welcome to everyone for joining us this, this evening. Uh, so, um, as Alison said, um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Liz Ballard and I'm the Chief Executive here at the Trust. And this uh, project and proposal is very much a passion of mine, as, as it is for other staff and the board. So it's really great to have this opportunity to share it with you and hopefully you'll also feel enthusiastic and uh, passionate about it as well. So uh, I'll, I will talk for about uh, 20 minutes, half an hour or so, and then we'll you know, have time for questions um, at the end. So just to start with then, how does it all fit? Well, um, this is a, a little bit of what I'm going to go through. I'm gonna just explain how and why our kill fits uh, with what we're doing at the Trust um, in Sheffield and Rotherham. And I'm going to provide a bit of an overview of the farm itself um, and talk a little about our vision. Uh, and then I'm going to just explain a bit about how we're funding it, because um, it's a really big project for us. And a bit about how you can get involved as well, if at the end you feel that you want to be part of it. That's fantastic. And we'd really like you to think that you can be. And we'll have the question and answer after that. So to start with, just a bit about why, why our kill, why, why are we even doing this? So I just want to stand back and take you back a little bit to um, a wider strategy at the Trust and what we're trying to achieve. So we have reviewed a lot of the work the Trust does in recent years, especially since COVID, and we have our strategy to 2030. And I'm not going to go into lots of detail and bore you too much with all these documents and words, but just to summarize really um, our thoughts on what our important um, priorities and ambitions are for our strategy 2030. And so I've sort of summed this up really in these four ambitions that we have. So these are quite you know, big ambitions. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly run through those. So. The first one is about um, tying in to the global targets around that the UN actually recently agreed through the um, COP15 for biodiversity, which was just before Christmas, 
And they've agreed about uh, this, this kind of target of 30% land, I'm going to say, and water is sort of separate, but land and water are great for nature. So in effect, um, the UK has signed up to this. And we locally are supporting this and thinking about how do we contribute in Sheffield, in Rotherham, in South Yorkshire to this ambition of 30% land and water great for nature. So that's very much kind of thinking spatially, looking at maps, looking at land and thinking where is that land uh, that's in really good ecological condition or that could be in really good ecological condition to create a nature recovery network, a network for nature. So, so that's, that's very much about land. But we've also, in Sheffield and Rotherham, particularly focused on water. Um, we don't have seas. Other wildlife trusts talk about coasts and seas, but actually our rivers, our wetlands are really important in our area. So we're thinking there about, well, what is the ecological condition of our rivers and streams and wetlands? And as many of you will be hearing and, and finding out recently, they are in really poor condition. So, so we think our well, baseline is about 3% land in good condition for nature currently. So we've got quite a way to go. And we also think that uh, water is in the order of 7 to 15%, to depending on which, which geography we look at, but it's pretty poor. So there's lots, lots to go at, and we have lots of ideas for how to approach that. And we'll be talking more about that in the autumn. But for now, uh, just hold the thought, 30% land and water great for nature. Also, abundance of wildlife everywhere, because it's not just about the habitat and the land, but it's also about the species and how we support them. So, for example, the moorlands in parts of the Peak District, Moors of the Future have done great work to improve the habitat, but we're not still not seeing some of the moorland species coming back, like such as Hen Harrier. So we want to see um, clouds of butterflies, massive flocks of birds, things that in the past we thought were um, abundant, were almost pests, have now since disappeared. So abundance of wildlife everywhere. And then uh, one in four people taking action for nature is very much about getting uh, sort of society and the community supporting and acting for nature. And there's a, a kind of theory of social change that you need about 20, 25% people to be signed up to an idea before it comes a tipping point and becomes the norm. So, so quite a, a, a big piece of work to do there. And some people on the call may, may have heard of Nature Recovery Sheffield, Nature Recovery Rotherham. And those are very much our, our kind of community action groups and networks where we're promoting and supporting people to, to be part of this Nature Recovery Sheffield and Rotherham programme. And then finally, five minutes to nature, because we mustn't forget that a lot of people don't have very good access to nature. There are parts of Sheffield and aspects of Rotherham where it's actually really difficult to, to get to nature. Um, and uh, it, it may actually be kind of a very deprived area in terms of just having um, bird song or trees on the doorstep. So uh, we're very conscious that if people aren't able to experience nature, they won't be able to protect it. They won't they won't value it, they won't understand it. So there's a real um, demand there that we, we still need to work hard on. So they, that's our overview. And so this, this uh, tonight that we're talking about is very much how does Oak Hill fit into this uh, concept that we're talking about with these four ambitions. So we've done some work on the nature recovery mapping and network, and this is a very initial draft and again we'll be sharing more on this hopefully in the autumn but just uh, this is very much um, starting to be based on a very strong evidence base a lot of modeling and mapping work underneath it and we're just starting to highlight project areas and key key areas and networks as part of that and you won't be surprised to know that obviously our kill falls within one of those kind of important priority areas. It also, for, for those of you who are members and supporters and some of our volunteers, you'll be very familiar with the project, the Sheffield Lakeland Landscape Partnership. Uh, and we just recently launched our kind of next 10 year plan, uh, which um, 
is the legacy of the project that was funded by Heritage Lottery, but actually the partnership continues. And one of the real successes of that partnership has been, in particular, how we've been able to work really positively with some of the farms within the Sheffield Lakeland area. And these are farms that have done actually some really great things for biodiversity because they're tending to be quite family farms, they're quite small scale, they're quite mixed farming, they're um, not working at an industrial scale. And there, there's um, some really great examples still of hay meadows. So, so there's lots that we've learned and lots of support that we've given to farmers in the area. And we really want to build on that and develop that. So that's um, been a very uh, important part of our thinking going forwards. And our kill farm sits within the Sheffield Lakeland area. So that's, again, another reason why we're talking about our kill. And of course, land purchase, uh, which this is, uh, means that the trust has uh, within its um, own kind of decision making uh, and um, its own um, legacy, more land for nature recovery. Ultimately, if you own land, you have control over it. So very much owning more land. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the size of the, the farm in a moment, but owning more land obviously means there will be more land for nature recovery. But just thinking about the things I said earlier about 30% of land and water great for nature, it's quite clear that we as a trust are never really likely to be able to own 30% of say Sheffield or Rotherham or South Yorkshire, that's a lot of land. And when you think that ag agriculture across, I think across the UK is probably something like 70% of land use. Um, and then on top of that, you have you know development and urban spaces. It's quite clear that we really do need to think about land for nature recovery that may also be with within farming land use. So, so we feel that we can't just think of land ownership, we need to think of how we influence and work in partner, partners with others, and that has to include farmers themselves. So why our kill? Uh, to summarise, really, uh, because um, at one level, if we hadn't purchased it um, and, and um, holding it in perpetuity, somebody else would have purchased it. And we have examples, and indeed, the fields across the road that we couldn't afford, we know um, have been purchased by another farmer, a um, more uh, sort of larger industrial farmer um, who has glyphosated the habitat and is now rotivating that, that, those fields which are and have been actually um, good breeding grounds for waders and, and in fact lapwing were nesting on it when they were glyphosated. So we are aware that if we hadn't taken it on, potentially there would have been loss of habitat that is very good currently for um, waders. So that was our concern, one concern. But we also not only wanted to sort of stop the loss, we also felt that Ugg Hill was an opportunity to promote um, more nature recovery. So not only just sort of halting things, but actually we call it bending the curve, turning the corner and seeing an opportunity to have more abundance of wildlife, you know, promote the site of nature recovery, support waders, uh, increasing numbers, support wildlife of all different types of species um, uh, being abundant across, across the farm. It ties in with Sheffield Lakeland legacy, as I've mentioned, and it provides us with an opportunity to, we, you know, we are not going to be part of the farming community. We are not farmers in that sense, but we have increasingly been working in partnership with farmers and influencing them, and they've influenced us as well. And this really puts a market down, says we are also in this arena as well. We um, uh, are looking at environmental land management scheme funding and how do we access that? And I guess sharing some of the pain that farmers are currently going through as well, which to some extent we are about um, the changes in regulations and legislation, some, some positive and some very uncertain and unclear. 
so we we kind of have that opportunity to feel like we're working with farmers and we're we are definitely sort of part of that landscape and finally uh, I think it also presents some some interesting opportunities for us to raise and discuss issues around uh, our relationship with food and nature uh, food farming and nature because um, you know far farmers are, can be often criticised, um, but they are part in part very much driven by what we demand as consumers in terms of food. Um, and I think there's some going to be some interesting discussions and debates um, at all levels, nationally, globally, and, and very, very much locally as well, about where our food comes from and how that all ties in with climate change and uh, nature recovery. So just uh, looking at the farm a little bit more detail. Um, so uh, some of you may know where it is um, or be a bit, um, some of you may be a bit unclear at the moment, but it's just to the west of Sheffield, um, above um, Bradfield, um, and uh, it's, it's um, very close. It's half an hour's drive, if that, from the centre of Sheffield. So, uh, this is um, it's perhaps not easy to see, but uh, it gives you um, the boundary of the land that the trust is purchasing. So you hopefully can see Ugg Hill uh, just on the right of your screen, um, which is this, this sort of fairly small settlement there, which is it takes its name from. And Ugg Hill Hall Farm was the name of the entire farm including some fields and the buildings there called Uphill Hall Farm, which you might just be able to work out um, just to the left of the, the bigger Uphill word. And some of that was in private ownership, but some of that was part of this farm uh, in its entirety. So we haven't taken on Uphill Hall Farm, the actual farm building itself, and we haven't taken on some of the adjacent in by land next to the farm which was called lot one. It was all part of divided into lots. There were six lots and lot one was the one that we didn't bid for. So that has gone to an alternative um, farmer, as I've mentioned, and some of those fields are the ones next to the farm that I'm talking about. So hopefully you can see there um, the land that we're purchasing um, and it's divided into these different lots. Uh, and there is a by it's surrounded bounded by roads on most sides particularly running through it um the uh by there is a byway which sort of runs through the middle uh on the left hand side as well it's got a a stream and a sitch that and a number of um watercourses and sinkholes and so on that run through it uh, which which feed into wet shore dikes and ultimately down into the reservoirs. So it's part of the upper catchment, which is also uh, another reason why we're interested in it. So here's a bit of a picture of the site, um, standing on one of the uh, hills with a well with a drone image, I think more than standing on the hill. Um, and you can see uh, some of the reservoirs in the distance. Um, but uh, you, you can see most, this is most of the farm, the majority of which is in uh, what we're purchasing. So to the left, you can see a small water, water body and a kind of um, semi-circle quadrant of uh, heathery um, habitat, uh, which is an old quarry. So that is the um, far extent on the left of your screen. And then there's a piece of triple SI, site special scientific interest, which is the bit adjacent to it, which is the less green, green sort of field. Then the byway, you can just about make out that sandy lane, because it's uh, gritstone. Then you have a series of fields that have been um, modified. They've had, probably had um, ryegrass sown, or they've been cut and they've been regularly cut for silage. So they're, um, they've been, uh, improved in farming terms and just over the other side of the road you can see a square of woodland that is not in our ownership I believe that's owned by Sheffield City Council but just to the left and adjacent to that 
there are a number of fields that we do own, so they are within our ownership. And they're probably um, the most changed. They are predominantly quite a lot of red clover at the moment. Uh, and then it's um, basically sweeps around to our ownership, sweeps around to the right. And then you can start to see there's a sort of strand, stream of um, woodlands that follows that, uh, that West Shore dike, which then, as you can see, goes on and down into the, ultimately down into the reservoirs. So, Hopefully that gives a, a fair overview. And as we come down towards the bottom of the screen, we're moving up uphill into our Kilmore and ultimately it tips onto uh, land ownership of um, the neighbour, which is more into um, our Kilmore itself. So um, just to share briefly uh, our vision for our Kill and where, where we're up to, um, with our thinking on how we want to take the land forwards. Um, so, firstly, we are using the term farm. So, um, it's very much, uh, in our view, going to continue in, in some sort of farm uh, practice. So, we're calling it Arc Hill Farm. Uh, we've dropped Ugg Hill Hall Farm to distinguish it from the building and land that we didn't buy. So we're just calling it Ugg Hill Farm. There's been a lot of, uh, a number of studies done by other organisations such as uh, Wildlife Trust and RSPB collaborating together and so on about uh, an economic model that requires quite low input farming. So this is about having uh, very little chemical input, fertilizer, etc. very little change to the, to the actual ex existing habitat where possible improvement, using much lower stocking rates um, that are more in keeping with conservation grazing um, and trying to get a, a better balance between economy, uh, nature and farm produce. So, that's a um, model we want to kind of test and learn from. We're not calling it a demonstrator site because we feel we, we have a lot to learn and we want to learn that with uh, some of the adjacent neighboring farms that we've been working with through Sheffield Lakeland, where we um, currently influence and work with about, uh, well, quite a number of farms that add up to about 1200 hectares. So. Uh, we're quite keen to continue that kind of partnership. Uh, so it's very much about farming and nature together. So we're calling it an, a nature-friendly farm, a nature-friendly farming model in shorthand. We're currently not using words like rewilding. That's not really what we're proposing here. We're, we might use techniques that rewilding projects use, but we aren't working at that scale. Uh, and we are um, uh, working with triple SI landscape. So we already have quite a lot of good quality nature on the site. And when you, if and when you visit the site, and some people who, who know have visited the site with us, um, there is a lot of wildlife already on the site. So we're not starting from a, a really poor, deprived, nature deprived site it's got quite a lot to offer so we need to be careful that we don't lose that but we actually promote and support that and its recovery so we're not starting from a rewilding approach where there's nothing and we're going to um, sort of try and um, bring things back it, we're also uh, not currently calling it regenerative farming which again is a term that some people are using um, that's um, uh, again a different model so at the moment uh, we're calling it a nature friendly farming proposal uh, so uh, that's why we're calling it our kill farm how we're funding it so it's a very big project for the trust it's the biggest project since i've been involved with the trust and i think it's the biggest project since uh, the trust started for those of you who 
been part of the trust for a long time. You will probably remember about Grena Woods. Grena Woods was a very big project, and um, this is comparable to that, but um, probably just slightly more ambitious than that. But that was a fantastic um, project, uh, and Nature Reserve purchase. So the farm was up for sale at uh, in lots, as I've mentioned, and for the lots from uh, two to six, it was 1.26 million pounds. So quite a substantial amount for us to, uh, to consider purchasing, finding and purchasing. So how we've approached that is we um, were able through uh, conversations with funders and donors, quite early on, before we actually even went through exchange, we were able to um, uh, secure around 260 um, or so, a little bit more than that, uh, as part of the actual payment at the time of exchange. So exchange happens, the, the, the land was transferred into different ownership just before Christmas. Now, when I say it's transferred into different ownership, it wasn't transferred to the trust. It was transferred to a third party foundation. Uh, this is a bit complicated, but I'm just sharing it with you so you can understand where we're up to. Um, so that third party foundation is basically now the owner of the, the site of Buckhill Farm. And we are challenged to repay them uh, the money they've spent on the farm uh, over the course of the next two years. So we have a, what might be considered by some to be a loan, but to others is called a financial facility. Uh, and we have 940,000 to pay back uh, in two years. So currently we've been working very hard and you've met some of you well, I've seen Alison at the start of the call. Alison has also been working very hard. Uh, and we've already secured quite a significant sum of uh, support, which we're really pleased about. Um, so that's quite a relief for us all. Uh, so currently, of the 1.26 million target that we had, we have 340,000 to find for the purchase. Uh, we still have a number of applications we've submitted to various charitable trusts and we're waiting to hear on those uh, and we feel quite positive about those, um, but we won't know the outcome of those until um, perhaps around Christmas time. So we'll have a very much clearer idea of whether we are going to be able to um, secure the land uh, uh, and ownership by the trust um, by Christmas. But equally, we also have the following year to continue to fundraise if we haven't met our target. In addition to the purchase, of course, there's setup and then there's revenue. Now, revenue, um, I'm not going to talk about a great deal here because that's about the economic model of the farm itself. And we're still working through how we've done some work on that course, but we're still working through details of that. And um, it depends on. And the nuances of how of, of the site. But in terms of setup, we know um, if we're going to have uh, stock on the site, we obviously need things like um, secure boundaries. Uh, there's a lot of dry stone walls up there, and some are in better repair than others. There's a lot of work to do to keep those in good order. But we'll also be using fencing, and we're also exploring no fence collars, which allow cattle to roam more freely. Um, and as we're talking about this kind of smaller scale, um, more um, traditional breeds and types of cattle um, and using them for conservation purposes as much as um, produce, uh, when we're exploring things like no fence collars, which allows them to be uh, managed almost remotely. Uh, so water is important, water supply for stock is obviously important and uh, electricity drives the um, pumps, uh, solar power pumps and so on to, to um, aid with that water distribution. So there's various things that we need to think about. Just about every gate is bent and falling off. So there's some quite uh, um, uh, numbers of, of 
gates and fences and um, various things that we also need to think about, signage and so on. So there's quite a lot of work to do to get it in all, all in good order. It's not all going to happen overnight, but we, we already have a fair estimate of some of that work, um, which we're considering really as part of the capital of setting up project. So that's uh, the other aspect that we're fundraising for. So just really to finish, um, just a couple of things I, I, I think I've covered, but uh, and I can't see the chat at the moment. So obviously we'll be looking at questions and answers in a moment, but common things that I've been asked so far, one is when will it be ours? So it will be ours, it will belong to the trust when we- Liz, I think your internet's just dropped off a little bit there. Oh, okay. So I think we just might have- uh... Oh, it might have the last couple, last 30 seconds or so, if it wasn't mine. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're all good now, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not quite sure where I got to, but uh, I've nearly finished. So um, just to say that um, a couple of common questions that I get asked is, uh, when will it be ours? Um, so as I've mentioned, it will be ours as in belongs to the trust. Once we have fully repaid this financial facility of 940,000 that I've mentioned, we already own some of it, but we won't get uh, that formally agreed and it won't formally all come to us until we've repaid that, that sum um, in full. But we are aiming for that to be by the end of this year. That's our optimistic um, uh, and currently looking quite realistic but if we need to we can carry that on into the following year from the year uh, is it a farm or a nature reserve currently our proposal is that it is not a nature reserve we are calling it a farm it is our kill farm so that is our approach to it so uh, which just puts a slightly different complexion for people on how they might see and view the land and be involved in it and so how can you get involved? Um, well, obviously donate. <laughs> you can see that we have a lot, lot of funding still to find. If you feel that you can contribute in any way, be it 50p or 50 pounds or 50,000 pounds, we are here. I'm very happy to um, receive that. And uh, I'm sure Alison will talk more about that. We'll put some more info in the chat. You can volunteer. We're already doing a lot of monitoring. We're really keen to use this year. Um, very much as baselining, so there's a lot of ecological monitoring going on and checking and seeing what's on the site so that we know exactly what, what's there before we make any changes to be careful about not losing anything or impacting anything negatively. You can obviously promote and share and tell other people about our plans, so hopefully you'll be in, feel interested and excited about it and you can share it with others, that's very welcome. And if you're not a member, of course, you can join us and uh, then be part of the story and um, find out much more about what we're doing through our membership magazine as well. So I'm going to uh, leave the talk there and um, stop sharing. And then hopefully uh, we can have a few kind of bit more discussion about um, some of the comments or questions you might have. Fabulous. Thank you very much. And sorry, I think that was my internet that was dropping out rather than anybody else's. So apologies for stopping in there. <laughs> um, we've had a few, quite a few questions. Thank you everyone for putting them in the chat and please do feel free to put, keep putting um, questions in. Um, Nick Thorpe has asked and um, said, last year, the clover fields adjacent to Oaks Peace were visited by hundreds of curlew and also a big group of geese. This year, there have been no geese and only a few pairs of curlew. How do you plan to recover what was normal when the land had sheep on it and was cut annually? So uh, we have only just taken really taken on the land. And if you've been up there recently, in fact, yesterday, the cut has been taken. Um, so it's taken us uh, a bit of time to get to understand what's going on on the farm. Uh, and um, yeah, we're, we're just getting into the process of working out what we want to do when. So um, that will be something that we work through this coming year and have in place for next year. 
Fantastic. Um, Dina Ward has asked, might University of Sheffield be interested in PhD student projects in sustainable farming? They may be. Uh, we talked to the University of Sheffield. I've just had a, I've just made contact with um, particularly Duncan Cameron, who's quite into soils and soil carbon. So I'm just um, trying to get, engage with them. And we are also uh, working quite a bit with Sheffield Hallam, uh, with students there, and we're looking at monitoring particular things like water flow and water quality on the site. So yeah, that that's all very. We're very keen to involve university uh, sort of research in in the process, and we have we have done a DEFRA test and learn with other farmers in the area to explore some of these new economic models and new ways of farming. So um, there's more, you know, there is um, a precedent for us with that, but we want to build on that with um, our people. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Richard Smith has asked, are polytunnels allowed on the land and other buildings? Um, well, we have at the moment no plans for polytunnels or buildings, that's not really where we're at. Whether there is, um, I mean, it, it falls all within the Peak District National Park area. Um, so it falls within the Peak District National Park Authority planning area. So in that sense, buildings would be part of their, their jurisdiction. But at the moment, um, where we stand, where we're kind of working out our plans, currently we don't have any plans polytunnels or buildings that's not really the kind of farming we're talking about um georgina hartley has asked will you be able to use government schemes such as elms yes we really hope so because that is very much the economic model of what a lot of farms and farmers are facing um, so we have registered the land with the Rural Payments Agency literally yesterday. Uh, it's taken quite a while because of a um, number of issues to do with boundaries and getting those right. Nothing is straightforward. Um, but very soon we hope that we can start to access things like the Sustainable Farming Initiative, which is the SFI, which is the first step on ELMS. And, and then ultimately we want to... Um, raise the bar as we get more familiar with what's on the farm and the um, biodiversity opportunities so that we can access countryside Stuart plus and so on so yeah very much hoping that we can access L. that will be a key part of the revenue model fantastic this is a, a good question from chris keel um, what do you consider to be the low-hanging fruit in terms of maximizing the potential for nature on the site Oh, crikey. Um, OK, well, um, some of our I mean, don't hold us to this because we are doing a lot of kind of processing and thinking about the, the best ways of doing these things. But first of all, um, the triple SI part, the, the 52 acres triple SI is not in very good condition. So we really want to focus on on kind of really getting that into good condition. And that's where getting the, some cattle on the site would really help. The, um, there is kind of remnant, remnants and fragments of heather, moorland and um, bilberry uh, and that kind of plant assemblage um, right up to the top, which is being kind of overshadowed by kind of a lot of grass and rank grass. So we want to kind of get in there and see if we can break that up and bring some of that heather moorland um, back. Uh, we, um, the water body is very interesting. It seems to be absolutely full of toads. Um, so there's a there's an opportunity to really kind of um, ex kind of work with that water body and um, kind of build on the biodiversity there that's, that's already there. We're also exploring. Um, we've, we've got to be really careful because of the waders on the site. And somebody's mentioned about the waders, and we are kind of thinking quite carefully about how we promote uh, their their abundance as, uh, as somebody somebody mentioned um, but the site is quite dry so in some areas so we want to look at taking up some of the drainage that was put in and trying to make the site wetter or more, more natural I should say 
Um, but we're also looking at how um, the Woodland Corridor might be um, sort of more uh, broadened through natural regeneration. Uh, we don't want to extensively plant trees. This is not a woodland planting project. That's not the vision that we have, but we think there may be some opportunities for woodland corridor connection between some isolated parts of, of the woodland. Um, there's also lots of opportunities for um, looking at how the stream flows and just um, giving giving that more space that, that provides more opportunities for natural flood risk management and things like that as well. So I could, there's loads basically, there's lo lots there and the site has, uh, you know, it's great. You, you walk on the site, you already straight away see lots of swifts feeding at the moment. There's, as someone's mentioned, there's curly, there's been the odd lapwing there. Uh, there's hares breeding. Um, there's lots of sets. So you know, there's a lot. There's a lot to see there. Fabulous. That was a great answer. And um, quite a few people are asking um, a few questions around how the farm will be managed. You know, whether there'll be a tenant farmer or whether it'll be somebody from the trust, and how that's going to work. Yeah. So we're just. Uh, again, we're just exploring that. We've got about two or three options in mind, which um, really range from, um, it's really to do with to what extent we're in partnership with a farmer, whether whether some of it's tenanted, whether we're working to a um, contract, or whether we're working in a, some sort of collaborative partnership. Um, we are our emphasis is that we do want to be working in partnership with a local farmer. So it's just really the process of how we go about that and legally how that would work, whether it would be quite a loose relationship or a contractual one. So, so we're just exploring options and we've spoken to informally, we started to work with a number of um, different farmers and talk to them about different ideas. So, so we're just beginning to build that relationship at the moment. Fantastic. Um, Paul Maddox has asked, can you tell us more about opportunities? So, sorry, Alison, I missed that. Opportunities for volunteer involvement, e.g. in baseline monitoring of birds and plants. Sorry, is oh, that, did you get yes, that? I did get um, that, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, so um, the Trust already runs um, an ecological monitoring programme across its nature reserves, Nature Counts. Uh, and if you are interested in participating in that or specifically in our kill, then just get in touch with us. Um, we've got a program of monitoring we've started. Uh, we, we would love more volunteers to take part. Um, so yeah, just email us on the, um, there's a volunteering at email, which um, is on our website. And if, if somebody gets a chance, maybe Alison or Rebecca might put the, the email or the link in the chat. Uh, please, please get in touch, and uh, yeah, we we can certainly point you in the direction of um, ecological monitoring. Great. And Paul's also asked. Presumably, there's going to be a major fundraising campaign. Are you able to tell us more about plans for this yet? Yeah. So, um, well, Alison could do that, but um, the uh, we basically are seeking um, uh, donations to support, particularly. Um, the final, obviously, we've got this this gap that we're still working towards of um, three hundred forty thousand for the purchase. As I say, we we are up, we have bid for that. We're positive about it. But um, yeah, the the more support we can get to sh to reduce that, that's very helpful. But equally, if we are successful with that, we will also need support for the setup costs that I mentioned. So we would really welcome donations and support for that. Uh, there is already a page um, on the website which tells you about our kill. And uh, Alison will probably just share a little bit perhaps at the end about um, how we're approaching the, the campaign as well. So yes, this, this is almost sort of a bit more of a, the kickstart of our fundraising campaign. Uh, we haven't really launched anything so far. We've kept it quite low key. Um, but we wanted to have this chance to share with people a little bit about our intentions so that people have the opportunity to decide whether they wanted to support it as well. 
Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's worth just saying as well. We have already had a lot of um, quite a few donations from individuals and members and things. Um, so yeah, thank you to everybody who's who's given already. And yeah, we've got lots more, which is going to be going out sort of more widely. We know we've had a lot of interest outside of you know just our membership and our supporters as well about um, the farm. So yeah, we'll be sharing lots more in the coming weeks. But it was important to us that we shared this this with members with members now. Uh, right, we've got loads more questions. Um, speaking as a nature-loving archaeologist here, have you any idea of the historic environment features on the land? Nature conservation and heritage conservation can often go hand in hand and funding from heritage sources could be an option for you alongside ELMS. Okay, so uh, we we don't know, we know snippets of the history. We know it was called, we think it was called Uggie's Gill, um, not Ugg Hill. Um, there's obviously history around some quarrying that went on on the site. We don't have a lot of background to that. I'm not sure how old that is. Um, and there are some shafts. Um, there are a number of shafts on the site. So just um, if people decide that they want to access the land, just be careful because you might fall down a mine shaft. Um, there is some limited fencing around those, but but please be aware that there are um, so there are some shafts on the site. Um, so uh, in terms of beyond that, uh, we've had land, some land searches done. We don't know much more. If anyone is interested in doing that historical research and working with us to tell us more about the history, uh, um, we, are, we, we would really welcome that. So please, if that's something you're interested in, then do get in touch with us. We'd, we'd love to work with you a bit more on that. Um, right, uh, John has asked, what is the access? Can anyone go up there and take a look? Yeah, so basically, um, if you know the area and you know um, kind of Sugworth Hall and the road that that's on uh, through to Oak Hill, you can drive along that uh, and you can see most of the site from that road. You can um, park uh, at various places along there, just pulling carefully uh, and walk up the byway, which is on the OS map. And again, um, that, that takes you up um, quite high and it gives you a very good view over the whole site as well. Uh, and there are a number of rights of way and there's also some of it is open access land. So if you, if you are uh, happy to look at an OS map, that's probably your best bet because that will give you an idea of um, what's open access land, which um, people obviously have a right to, to access and go on that and explore from there. Um, we are, just be aware, because it is a site um, for waders and hares, please keep your dog on a lead. If you take a dog, do not let your dog run, run across the site. Um, uh, particularly important. Uh, that, that that doesn't happen. So um, please be very careful if you are a dog lover and want to take your dog, that's fine, but it must be on a lead. Don't let it run on the site. Um, the site, the reason why we, we're just sort of thinking about other access opportunities, um, you know, that's all work to do, um, but we are thinking about how we offer some sort of guided walks, um, particularly for members. Uh, so uh, Alison will no doubt be sharing more about that through Kingfisher. So if you're a member of the Trust and you'd like a bit more of an in-depth tour and have a look at the site, then we're hopefully going to offer some of those um, uh, coming up over the next few months. So keep an eye out for those if you're a member. Uh, we've probably got time for a couple more questions. Um, Christopher's asked, you have said this is not going to be a demonstrator farm, but in reality, the project makes no sense unless it demonstrates something, and that surely is important with regards to the level of farm involvement. How far can the project be successfully replicated? Okay, so the, just the reason why we're not calling it demonstrator is because um, uh, you're right, kind of, in what you're saying, totally. Uh, it, it's just, um, which we've We've stuck with test and learn because there's something about us not being too, um, let's say, arrogant. 
that we know all the answers and a demonstrator project I guess it sounds a bit like we we know what the answer is and we're, we're showing everyone how to do it and that really is not the case we have learned a great deal from working with the farmers locally uh, and we've also been learning from from others as well um, and uh, yeah, of the wildlife trusts and so I noticed someone put in the chat I didn't know wildlife trusts run farms actually a lot of wildlife trusts do run farms it's not unusual um uh, so so we are learning from others and yes ultimately we very much want to have discussions and site visits uh with with and collaborations with farmers absolutely but what we're not saying is we know all the answers, come and talk to us because we can tell you how to do it because that, that isn't really uh, where we're at at the moment. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, there was a question a bit further back, I'm just trying to add, oh, here it is. Will it be used for education um, with school groups eventually? Well, um, ideally, yes, but obviously at the minute there are no facilities. I mean, when you, if and when you go up and have a look at the site and hopefully you got an impression from that, that kind of um, drone view is there are no facilities. There's nowhere to have a wee, you know, and uh, I can tell you school kids, they do like to have a wee. So uh, it's quite, um, you know, that is quite a challenge at the minute, uh, but we are, we'll, we will think about that and think about that longer term. Um, but at the moment, uh, it's not, there's no shelter, there's nothing up there. So, you know, it's not going to happen next year that we'll be taking school groups there. Fabulous. A bit, maybe a bit more of a tricky one. What is going to happen with the grouse shooting alongside the byway? uh that's not on that land uh, it must be on the adjacent land in which case that's entirely up to the adjacent land donor um if anybody's got i might have missed a couple of questions so if there's any very urgent last ones if you could just repost them again we'll try and get i think i've got through most of them or at least other ones that sort of cover things um, somebody's asked if is there scope for hedge planting or renovation on the farm? Uh, I think there probably is some scope for hedge planting, particularly around the byway. In fact, I think uh, some somebody we're not quite sure who previously has started to put in a a small sort of tree shelter belt on the byway. So um, there's definitely some more work to do there. So uh, yeah. I think there are opportunities for that, but again, you know, we've not we've not worked all this out. There's a lot. It's a big farm. We want to get to know it, and we haven't sort of uh, planned everything to the last degree. But yeah, I I think there's opportunities for hedge planting, and as I say, for that ex site expansion of some of the woodland copses that are already up there as well. Fabulous. Um, Wendy's um, reposted her question. How will you clear the infestation of docks and thistles and ragwort, which were not a problem previously, but now give the ground nesting birds nowhere to land? Uh, well, um, as I say, there's been cutting up there recently, uh, literally today um, or yesterday. Uh, so there's been some cutting taken. So, um, so that's happened. Fantastic. So I'm just trying to scroll through and make sure I've got everything. A question on the security of water supply to Ugg Hill Hamlet. Just going to see if I can find the original question. Um, so I think this is to do with um, there is a, um, a kind of water well that is um, in a water source, I think that's what this this might be. Yeah, to do. There's, a water, water, there's a sort of yeah. water source that that has a convoluted pipe work that goes across the land and then um, supplies a number of properties. Um, so uh, part of our setup work and part of our responsibility is to ensure that that um, that water supply, that certainly the immediate surrounding of the well. And the pipe work um, uh, is is um, secure, 
So um, we we will do what we need to do as a landowner to ensure that that's in place. Um, probably more so than previously, actually, because it's not been in very good condition. So we're looking at updating some of that. Right. Um, and there was another question about dry stone walling, but I think somebody else answered it in the chat already that, that we've already had volunteers up there working on the dry stone walls. Yeah, we have. And if anyone wants to join some uh, uh, world, um, the world walling volunteers, um, I'm sure they'd be very interested. So again, email using the email that's been shared already, the volunteer email and uh, yeah. There's lots of walling to go at, so please feel free to, to join them. Fantastic. I think I've covered nearly all, I think I've covered all the questions. Um, if anybody else has got any other questions that they want answering, please um, send them through to us afterwards and we can try and answer them or else, um, you know, if we're getting lots of people wanting to know the same sorts of things, we can always put some sort of FAQs up on the website because I'm sure there'll be other people that haven't been able to to join us today. Um, before we finish, Liz, is there anything else you wanted to say before we sort of round off today? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, uh, just thank you all for being interested in coming along to hear where we're up to. As, you, as you've heard, you know, there's a lot still for us to think through and work through. Uh, we're really excited about the project, but um, we also know it's going to be quite challenging. And we know that some people will agree with what we're doing and some people will disagree with what we're doing. Um, but we're very, very keen to try and explain and talk to people and work with people. And uh, yeah, it's, it's about um, bringing that balance of nature and farming together. That's our challenge. Well, thank you so much, Liz, for um, yeah taking us through all of that today. We're having loads of lovely comments coming through the chat. So um, thank you for your feedback. And yeah, thank you for uh, answering all of everybody's questions and me putting you on the spot with some of them as well there. <laughs> um, a special thank you as well to everybody who's joined us this evening and for all of your enthusiasm and support of the project. Um, a special thank you to everybody who's joined our community of members of the Trust and who continues to support us in that way. And as I said earlier, to everybody who's already given generously to the project. Um, we'll be sending um, some more information out by email probably tomorrow, just a short feedback form about how this evening's been um, and also where you can find more information. But it's all on our website, which is wildsheffield.com forward slash Ughill. So there's lots of information on there. Um, and yeah, as we said earlier, we'll be sending a lot more information out to members and um, supporters and the wider public um, about our fundraising campaign as well and you know you're very much part of this journey with us so as we get you know more results of those kind of bids last bids we've got in we will keep you updated because uh, yeah we just want to get over that finishing line and make sure that it that Ugg Hill becomes ours for the future so thank you very much again for joining us um, and have a lovely rest of your evening <laughs>